tonight on Revolutionaries. And then we've built our own virtual internet on top of the real internet. You know, we use our own routing protocols, our own communication protocols, our own app layer enhancements to make it go really fast. You know, if, if the way you would build the internet if you own the whole thing and we're starting over. Tonight we'll learn how a $50,000 challenge grant in 1998 produced the technology that keeps much of the internet running today. Meet self-described algorithm guy Tom Layton, an MIT professor turned corporate CEO, and learn the fascinating story of Akamai. Major funding for revolutionaries is provided by the Intel Corporation. I want to ask you uh, about an experience that you've recently had, which I think will help set in further context the discussion we're going to have tonight, and it was about the, the World Cup. The 2014 FIFA World Cup turned out to be the largest live sporting event ever delivered. There were 50 broadcasters that streamed or provided on demand all 64 matches in 80 countries. The final match generated peak traffic of 6.9 terabytes of data a second which was equivalent to 4,312 copies of a full-length feature film being delivered every second. Is that what you envisioned when you started Akamai <laughs> back in 1998? Um, yeah. <laughs> that was the idea. In fact, I, you know, I think we were wrong in the estimates that it took us this long to get to that scale. Uh, and as big as that scale is and, and record-setting as it is, Probably there's another factor of a thousand to go. Uh, you know, this World Cup was a factor of ten more than the last one, uh, and if anything, I think the uh, traffic levels will accelerate as more watching goes online and as the quality levels improve. Because as the quality gets better, that means a lot more traffic, a lot more bits have to come down that line to produce a good quality picture, which we've all come to expect. We do, you know. Always what you got seems pretty good until the next, you know, quality improvement comes and all of a sudden you got to have that and that old thing looks old. Yeah, yeah. So let's, let's wind the tape back for a minute to the beginning uh, for you. You were raised in Northern Virginia in Arlington. Your dad was in the Navy. You were telling me a few minutes ago he became a staffer to a very, very famous Admiral, Hyman Rickover, who was just a legend uh, in the Navy at that time. And you were attracted to math. So let's talk a little bit about what attracted you to math. When did you know that and, and what exactly was it? Uh, I think I knew it before I can remember most anything else. Uh, you know, there's a certainty in mathematics that you can actually prove something. And, you know, as long as you believe the axioms that were used as the assumptions, then there's no dispute. It's, it's true, absolute truth. And you don't have that in any of the sciences. You know, you can observe experiments and probably it's true, although as we've seen time and time again that there's some new theory comes along and it's a little more complicated than you thought. Math is, um, is, very, is very pure and very clean that way. Mm. So undergrad at Princeton, then PhD at MIT, joined the faculty at MIT, and, and thereafter really working uh, as an academic in applied mathematics and computer science, sort of the, the intersection of, of computer science and and purity and truth. Mm -hmm. um, why algorithms? So what was it about algorithms that really caught your fancy? You know, it's a, a way to do things much more efficiently or quicker. And, and my approach was from the mathematical side and theoretical computer science. So I wouldn't necessarily write any code, but I would prove a theorem that would say this algorithm would run in this number of steps. You know, and you know, a classic example would be how many steps do you need to take n items and put them in sorted order. And the naive approach is you compare everything to everything else and it's sort of like n squared amount of steps you got to do. And lo and behold, there's a way to do it a whole lot faster. You know, that's sort of not obvious. You know, a lot of the folks in the audience here probably are aware. Uh, and that's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. And then you can prove it just always works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it made it, you know, very interesting and appealing. What was the environment like at MIT with your 
your colleagues, other people in the faculty at that time, the, the kind of um, setting for someone like you sitting at this, not entirely new, but still very cutting edge approach to computer science and math. I, it was a fantastic environment. Uh, first, there was a, a lot of folks like me interested in the mathematical aspects of computing. Uh, really brilliant people, brilliant students, you know, modern cryptography, a lot of what we're doing today was invented there, you know, RSA, uh, Ravesh, Shamir, and Adelman, you know, we're all there. Uh, Len Adelman for a while was my advisor when I first got there. Uh, Adi Shamir was visiting, of course, Ron Ravest has, you know, has been there forever. Um, incredibly vibrant, exciting environment, you know, then later on, Tim Berners-Lee came and ran the web consortium and uh, very different, you know, perspective, but again, you know, very interesting and you can see with the future, you know, from your colleagues, very exciting environment. How much of, how much of an influence was it to have Tim Berners-Lee there and just literally a few doors down from you? You know, it might be pivotal. You know, it's hard to know how history would evolve if it was, a, you know, a different way. Uh, but, you know, having, you know, him and his group be down the hall and having the interactions with that group and hearing their views about what some of the challenges were going to be. Uh, you know, and Tim's obviously a very prescient fellow and, you know, in 95 saying, you know, hey, web congestion is going to be a big problem. You know, he knew the kinds of things that, you know, my group was working on and said, hey, this might be a, a pr good problem for you guys to think about. And uh, we did, and, and he was right. It was, uh, it was a, a big, good problem to work on. Well, and that, that was prescient, because just to remind everyone, it was 1994, just a year earlier, when Netscape first commercially released its browser, the Netscape Navigator, which was the thing that put so many of us online at that time. And it seems like just within a year of the release of that, and the first few million people coming onto the World Wide Web, it was already clear there was going to be a problem. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I guess it got really famous with Victoria's Secret in the 99 Super Bowl. You know, and they, uh, Victoria's Secret was one of the very first e commerce companies, and uh, they wanted people to go online to buy lingerie on their website. And so they ran an ad in the 99 Super Bowl saying, uh, well, they, they, they showed the models in the lingerie walking down the catwalk and saying, come to our website Tuesday night at 9 o'clock and you can see the whole fashion show. And so Tuesday night, a little before 9 o'clock, not only was their site down, but all of Dallas, the internet in Dallas was down. Uh, you know, and then you, you think about, well, what, they don't know exactly how much traffic there was because it all went down. Uh, but, you know, they, uh, about 300 megabits a second was the, all the capacity they had. And now you think about where we are today with the World Cup, well that was megabits, then there's gigabits, and now we're talking terabits. Yeah. You know, so just orders and orders of magnitude growth. So it's sex and sports, and you put those two together. <laughs> and, and a little beer, you and know. And a little and beer, yeah. and that <laughs> is a, the races. Yeah. there you go, the world is in flames. All right, so uh, Wired Magazine wrote in a, in a really a wonderful, wonderful article just as Akamai was getting started that Tim Berners-Lee walks down the hall and asks you if this problem that we were talking about was called the hotspot problem at that time. Mm -hmm. And he said, could distributed algorithms solve the hotspot problem? So can you, can you talk about how that conversation went or how the, that whole process worked and what that meant? Yeah, you, you know, he realized that if you try to have a website, the origin for a website be in one place, or maybe even in a couple places, that if a lot of people wanted to get access to that content at one time, they, they would all electronically go to that place and it would get flooded with requests. And Dallas goes down. And Dallas goes down, yeah. Uh, and that's the hot spot, because it's just, it's too hot, too many requests coming in. And so the logical way to deal with that is to have the content be distributed from many locations. Uh, now on top of that, you have the, the problem of deciding now where every end user is going to get served from. You know, what computer is going to give them what they want. And you know, today we deliver over 30 million items or answers to requests every second. And there's no centralized computer 
that could figure out how to do all that optimally. It's just too big a computational problem. And so you need a distributed algorithm, the intelligence that figures out for every end user of the 30 million that are making a request any second, which server should serve them and make it all work with all the internet content. That has to be a distributed algorithm that is managed by, well, over 100,000 machines. So what made that such an interesting problem for you to work on? Well, that, that's a very cool challenge. You know, how do you do that? And, uh, you know, my background at that time, we were working on the, the theory, the mathematics of how do you route data through a network uh, to avoid congestion, to get data where it's trying to go quickly and not overwhelm any link in the network. And that's pretty close to the challenge that Tim laid out. You know, and he had a special case where you've got content at various sources and a zillion people potentially trying to get access to the different content. And how do you manage all that? You know, what's the air traffic control for that? Uh, and that's the kind of stuff where, where we were working and we were very interested in those kinds of problems. There was a, a brilliant graduate student in your group at that time named Danny Lewin who also, it appears, wanted to work on that problem. Did you, did you approach him? Did he approach you? How did, how did that famous pairing happen? Uh, he approached me. In fact, I didn't, he came to MIT to work with me. I didn't know this until actually a couple of years ago. Um, you know, as they were doing the, you know, Danny's life history, I, I learned that. Uh, but he came to MIT and uh, he, you know, signed up to be my TA for the Parallel Algorithms course, you know. And so I got to know him that way and it didn't take long to realize he's a pretty brilliant, you know, uh, student. And so we started working together and so I, you know, engaged him in these problems to do with web congestion. And uh, he, you know, did some brilliant work and uh, prize-winning master thesis and ultimately a lot of that work led to Akamai. Now he comes to you and says, uh, or maybe it's the two of you together, say, we think we've got this solution to a very tough mathematics and computer science problem and there's a business plan in here somewhere as well. Let's talk about how that happened and how two guys who are deeply involved in applied mathematics, I mean certainly solving a real world problem, then decide to take the next step and say there's a business in here. Yeah, that was a sort of a long story, unusual path, because uh, neither of us had any intention of forming a business. Uh, I don't think either of us really had, you know, a business bone in our body at the time. We were certainly clueless in any case about well, business. Well, this was the heyday of the, the first generation of internet companies, 98, 99, when everybody who did have a good idea was trying to do that. But that wasn't the way that you started out. No, that wasn't us. Uh, you know, it, the way it started was in the fall of 97, uh, Danny was you know, talking to his next door neighbor in the dorms at MIT, and his next door neighbor was at the Sloan School. And Danny was complaining that he was nearing bankruptcy, for real. Uh, you know, we had two kids in private school. He was uh, a grad student, so his loans are mounting. He wanted to be a professor uh, in algorithms, mathematical computer science, and back then, you know, the only thing lower on the salary scale in the university was a math professor. Uh, you know, <laughs> but all the rest of computer science is much higher. We, we couldn't get funding and, uh, you know, that's changed today. You know, and partly I think Google and, you know, some of the other companies mm -hmm. that now the folks, the kids that studied that stuff, you know, they got a, you know, a great path. But it wasn't that way then. And uh, he was worried about literally going broke. And his uh, neighbor suggested entering the MIT 50K contest, uh, which was a business plan competition because his neighbor knew that Danny was doing this cool work, you know, on the internet. Uh, sounded like it might be relevant. And uh, Danny didn't know it then. Dan Danny thought that if he won, he could get $50,000 and pay off his student loans. And that's not how it works. Uh, we found out later that if you win, you get 35 k and you got to use it to start a company, which we had no intention of doing. But we didn't know. And uh, so Danny and his next door neighbors named Pritish Nijawan, you know, they, they needed somebody with gray hair to make it look reasonable. That was me. I had less gray hair then than I do now. Uh, so we, we entered the 50K. And um, that meant writing a business plan. So we got books out of the library, how to write a business plan, because we had no idea whatsoever. Uh, you know, one thing led to another, and uh, we made the final round of six out of 150 entrants. And, you know, people as, as teams were, didn't make the cut to the next round, their team members would join a team that was still in the hunt. 
So by the end of the competition, we had about 30 people uh, join the team. And I remember being very impressed, you know, with two things. One was a business guy from California showed up in my office wanting to join the team. I thought, oh my God, he's a real business guy and he wants to join our team. He came from California to join our team. Wow, that's pretty amazing. And then a student from Harvard Business School came all the way down Mass Ave <laughs> to join our team. And that was really stunning. You know? <laughs> An you know, even longer journey. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a long two or three miles, you yeah. know. Um, and, uh, you know, urban legend is that we won. It's not true. They only listed first, second, and third. And we weren't listed. And I think we were probably last. You know, when we, we saw the other teams in the final round, we, we really gained more of an appreciation for how clueless we were in business. Um, and after the, the 50K, we were approached by several of the judges who were VCs. It just, you know, crazy story. At that time, before that, I didn't know what VC meant. You know, it sounds so silly here today, sitting here and saying that, but that's, you know, where we came from. Yeah. Um, and they said, let's form a company. And they said, uh, you know, it's MIT, it's the internet, it's sexy. We go out, we form the company, we flip it in a year, we all go home happy. And, you know, the final evidence that, you know, about our clueless and naivete, we said no. <laughs> and uh, we said no uh, because we didn't think that our business plan would work. And at the time, our business plan was to sell the technology to the carriers. And we went to go see UUNet, that was a big deal at the time, AOL, HarvardNet, uh, you know, in the Cambridge area, trying to, you know, get them interested in what we were doing, you know, the caching technology. And they would see us because we were MIT, you know, so they'd let us in the door. But then they heard about distributed algorithms and what we're trying to do, and they said, wait a minute, you know, Everybody knows that distributed algorithms are an ivory tower concept. Thank you very much. Please go back to your ivory tower. And they weren't interested, so we figured the business wouldn't really work at that time. I liked being a professor. No super desire to form a company. Danny wanted to become a professor. Uh, no super desire to form a company. But at the same time, we you know, were thinking about, okay, well, how can we get this technology out there? Because we know it ought to be useful you know, that it should make the whole system work better, the internet work better, it should save money, um, and it should allow the internet to scale. And so we changed the business plan to sell to content providers, and we talked to some of them, and they said, yeah, we might pay you to do this, you know, if you built a company and ran it, but we didn't want to build a company, and we, we kept trying to get the carriers to do it, ultimately to the point where we'd give it away, just do it, and we couldn't, couldn't make that happen. And so for us, you know, you know, I love math, you know, I, you know, and my output would be a paper and I'd be thrilled if five people read it and said, nice paper, Tom. Yeah. You yeah. know, and I'd be very happy. Uh, but this was something at a different scale. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so we, we finally, you know, bit the bullet and created the company. Well, the other thing I love about that story is you didn't even finish in the top three business plans. And, you know, today you've got a market cap of over $10 billion, a couple of billion dollars a year in revenue, and those other three must have been hellishly good business yeah. plans. <laughs> well, you know, there, there was a tie for first place. Direct hit won, um, and they sold later during the bubble to Ask Jeeves, and the other one was a nonprofit. And that was a little, you know, painful when a nonprofit beats you, you know, in a business plan <laughs> competition, but. Careful, you're sitting in a nonprofit tonight. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you get started? Finally, after, after months of denial or more, you finally bit the bullet and decided to do it. What happened? Well, um, we uh, created the company, which meant we left MIT. I, my office was getting pretty crowded with 30 people in it during the uh, competition. And uh, we moved across the street and you know, bought, rented office space and uh, hired uh, or gave job offers to all the students that had worked on the project. Uh, and then I had been coach of the MIT programming team, and so I called up all the former members and you know, tried to recruit them to the company. Uh, and we were successful in getting a really strong, couple dozen you know, MIT students or, or recent graduates um, to start the company. And then we decided, okay, we gotta get you know, an experienced business leader. You know, I, I told Danny, hey, look, if you wanna be CEO, I'll come work for you. He said the same thing back, and then we both decided, no, neither one of us you know, was qualified to be CEO. 
because uh, of our lack of experience. And uh, we managed to attract Paul Sagan. Uh, he'd been uh, hired by Battery Ventures uh, to sort of check us out. We managed to convince him to join us. And then later, we got George Conradus as our first CEO. Who had been the number two at IBM. Yes. And, you know, when we created the company, we made a fantasy list of CEOs. You know, you never expect to get them. Uh, but George was on the top of the list. And, uh, you know, he had since gone on and was now at uh, uh, another VC firm at Polaris Ventures. And when we finished out the first round, actually the, the day of the closing, it was Battery and another VC. The other VC dropped out at the very last hour. And a little scary time for us, but Battery stuck with us. We closed half the first round and then recruited Polaris. And the deal was Polaris would fill out the first round if George would come on our board. And uh, once we got him on our board, then we seduced him into being CEO. And now we had really good you know, business leadership for the company. So the company goes public in October of 1999. Uh, like so many internet companies, you, you rode the rocket up. The stock eventually went to $300 a share. And uh, Akamai increasingly became a key solution to help the web succeed. Uh, and then comes the downturn, and then comes some other things. And I want to talk about that in a minute. But before we go there, let's, let's just go to, uh, to talk about how Akamai works today. Now, Akamai has been described as sitting on the edges of the internet. Why is that, and how exactly does that work? Yeah, so we place our computers, our servers, in thousands of locations around the world. Uh, you know, they're on the Stanford campus network. They're on the Berkeley camp campus network. Um, they're, it, we try to put them everywhere there's internet users, close to where they connect. So in big cities, we'll be in hundreds of places. Uh, and the idea being that when you go to one of the sites that is a customer, you don't have to go all the way across the country or across the world to get to their data center. You just go across that last mile to hit an Akamai server. And that's where you connect. You don't see it, uh, but that's what's happening. And then we've built our own virtual internet on top of the real internet. You know, we use our own routing protocols, our own communication protocols, our own app layer enhancements to make it go really fast. You know, if, if the way you would build the internet if you own the whole thing and we're starting over. Um, and so it works a lot better uh, that way. You connect locally, and if we have to go get some data, like your credit card back in a data center, we can do it super fast and get around, around the bottlenecks. Um, so that's how it works. You don't see it. Um, you know, we're probably the biggest entity on the web you've never heard of. Uh, but we do deliver uh, the content for, I think, 97 of the top 100 commerce sites, um, all the top media sites, you know, a lot of the major brands you go to. There's and up like, to 30% of all internet traffic on any given day can run through the Akamai System. Yeah, it's hard to know because the exact number, you know, yeah. that would be based on bits, you know, 15 to 30 percent, you know, based on deliveries, probably higher, um, and depends, you know, where you are in the world, probably as well. Um, so now back in the day, we're talking about sitting on the edge of the internet, there was much more edge than there was centers. Today there are a lot of centers, there's still a lot of edge, but was that your architecture from the very beginning? You knew from the outset you wanted to be out away from these concentration points. Why, why was that? Because the concentration points are the bottlenecks. Uh, the data centers are the targets for the attacker, the single point of failure. Um, you see this today in the debates that go on in Washington. You know, as, uh, you know, movie providers will complain to a carrier that they can't get you know, their movies streamed at high bit rates. And the problem really is there's not enough capacity there, and there never will be. That problem's going to get worse. If you were to add up all the last mile connections you know, that exist in the world, like you know, you maybe have your Fios connection or you know, at 40 megabits a second, pretty well connected in this area, um, then you'd have tens of thousands of terabits a second. Um, and we're going to need that if we ever want to think of a world where you know, a billion people go home at night and want to watch some TV or a movie over IP at, at high quality. You're going to need tens of thousands of terabits a second. If you look at all the big backbones and all the big backbones capacity or all the data centers and all the capacity to those data centers, 
two orders of magnitude less than that. Mm. Uh, so not close. And, and the peering points where you hear about all the congestion problems today, you know, that's why we formed the company way back when. And, and now you're, you're really starting to see that take place. And you need a different architecture where your, your servers are in thousands and thousands of locations. There are a couple of quotes from that Wired article I mentioned earlier that I want to read now. Um, Network growth doesn't scare algorithm people. I love that phrase, algorithm people. They always push things to infinity anyway. <laughs> and the other is Leighton and Lewin knew that the larger the network grew, the better the solution would perform. Now, let me, first of all, you're an algorithm person. Do you always push things out to infinity? Is that, was that the original thing you were thinking about? Yeah, uh, you know, because we're mathematicians. Sure. And you're thinking about a problem of size n, and you think about it in the limit as n goes to infinity. Because the case when n is 2 or 10 or 100 really is not interesting and is not scalable. Um, and so when we would build our design, it's built in mind with n going to infinity, and, and that's when it really gets most effective. Uh, you know, one way to think about it is I think of that sorting algorithm, and it takes n squared steps. And then say you had another algorithm that would take 10 times n steps. Well, if n is 1, n squared looks pretty good. 1 squared is 1, 10n looks pretty bad, it's 10. But as n becomes, say, a million, 10n is 10 million, a million squared, oh my goodness, what, what is that? You know, billion, gazillion, you know, a much bigger number. Mm -hmm. And suddenly that 10n is looking pretty good. Mm -hmm. And that's what the mathematicians like to think about, you know, is, is going to infinity. And the internet was a perfect environment for that kind of analysis because it is enormous and growing at huge rates. And that's why as we got a lot bigger, our solutions become a lot more effective. And the traditional approaches, you know, that poor guy with the n squared algorithm, he's doomed. And you, you're seeing that, you know, play out on the internet mm. today. And then how could you, what sort of model could you build? It must have been mathematical uh, because it could only be theoretical at that point. What kind, of, what kind of model could you build that could say, look, no matter how large this network gets, we know our solution is going to stay ahead of it? Well, that's where the math comes in with proving the theorems. Yeah. There's a certainty to that. Uh, now, things can go wrong in systems, you know, and that's one of the big learnings we had as mathematicians. It, there's a big leap from math to code, and then from code to a system, and then having the system always work. Yeah. You know, those are huge leaps, and a lot of things go wrong. But at least you can be confident in the architecture and in the algorithms that they're going to be there for you and work because you've got, you know, mm, proofs mm, behind mm. it. So again, it was that truth and purity that you spotted yeah. very early on. All right, let's go back now to, um, it's 2000. Your stock goes to 300. Beginning in the second quarter of 2000, the bottom falls out of the internet. Everybody's stock starts to fall. And it wasn't necessarily your financials that were affecting the stock price at that point. But eventually, the stock does go from 300 to 5. Oh, even worse. Went from 350 to 50 cents, and our, our debt became junk debt, 30 cents in the dollar, and it had more value at the junk status than our equity had. It was as, as bad as you get. We were, we were dead in everybody's view. So what was that like? Painful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, we went very quickly from a situation where you know, we were worried about all the 19 and 20 year old undergrads that were zillionaires. You know, imagine you're 19 or 20, you're a sophomore or a junior at MIT, you're working at this company and all of a sudden you're worth tens of millions of dollars or more. Because we were very liberal handing out stock, you know, to all the, you know, the undergrads that came. And um, we did make one rule. We said you can work for us for a year and then you have to go back and get your degree. You can come one day a week. We will let you vest while you get your degree because we really wanted to be sure that all the students finished their, you know, the degree program they were in. And that was one of the things we were, we were proud of. They all finished, despite the chaos of having all this money. Uh, but by the time we were starting to figure out what to do with that problem, it all collapsed. And now we had the reverse problem, that a bunch of them had, you know, vested their options and exercised them, but were holding on to them uh, for the capital gains tax, which is a year. And during that year, well, the stock goes to near zero. All of a sudden, they owe tens of millions in taxes. 
and they have no assets. They're back to, you know, a lot of them normal student status, which is a disaster. Mm -hmm. You know, so we had to help, you know, bail them out, you know, from that situation. So it just, it was horrible. We grew the company to 1,500. We, you know, had taken leases on a huge amount of real estate in Cambridge at very high prices. And, you know, before you knew it, we had to lay off two thirds of the company. Um, you know, all our customers are going broke. We have to get out of leases. One of the good things about everybody thinking we were dead is we could at least get out of the leases, you know, because we say take five million now or wait in line in court and get nothing because, you know, we looked pretty dead. Um, you know, so it was, it was really brutal going yeah. through that experience. And I think it defines our character as a company today, you know, having gone through something that was really, really hard. Uh, of course, the, the most horrible thing of all by far was when, you know, Danny's killed right. on September 11th. So let's, uh, let's talk about that for a minute because something really, really terrible does happen. He's on board the first plane that goes into the World Trade Center on 9-11. When did you know that Danny Lewin was on that plane? Well, I, I worried about it when I heard because we've been up very late the night before. Uh, we we're actually working through the riff as to who was going to have to get laid off, um, you know, till very late at night. You know, he went home and got an hour of sleep before heading to the airport, and I knew he was going to L.A. the next morning. Um, I didn't know for sure until I, you know, once I heard the news there was a plane crash, the phones were out. We couldn't call anybody, uh, but I went into the office, and then, you know, we knew it was mm -hmm. really bad. And how, how did you cope with that as a company? It was very, very hard. Um, you know, Danny was our heart and soul, um, a great leader, super smart. Um, you know, so it was a devastating loss, you know, and we were very close, devastating personal loss. Um, that day was also very tough on the company because, um, you know, the crazies came out and attacked all the government websites. Or maybe they were tied into the uh, plane attacks, I don't know. But they were all taken down, and this is the time when people want to, you know, the phones aren't working so well, they want to find out from the government what's happening. And simultaneously, you're seeing the network under attack, and that has all of the ramifications for yeah. your technology. So we had to do emergency integrations on a dozen uh, major websites. So the news sites, we did emergency integrations for them, you know, CNN and the places people were going, because all the websites were going down from the uh, load. But we, you know, the team just did a fantastic job through the grief, got all those sites up and running that day. Um, so it was, it was really hard, you know, and then in the aftermath, uh, we had to replace Danny. And that was not easy to do. Um, you know, so a lot of us picked up, we were already working pretty hard, but a lot more work for an extended period. You know, in some sense, you know, uh, so, you know, so many people love Danny, you know, that they did work extra hard. And it, you know, brought the company together with even more of a determination to survive. You know, that we weren't going to, you know, we've seen the worst. You can't do anything to us now. Right. You know, we're going to succeed. It's often said that even though that crash undermined a lot of people's faith in so much that was happening on the Internet, there were great models that had been built that did survive. Your model survived. Google survived. Amazon survived. There were some things that were just fundamentally sound and could carry on. Is, was, it, uh, was it that sort of fundamental soundness of this being able to see into infinity and plan the architecture that you had laid the groundwork for that actually helped you rebuild in addition to the spirit and the determination? Yeah, I think that's a requirement. About? Yeah, you had to have that. And you had to have the spirit and determination and the great people. You know, and it took us till 2004 to become profitable. It was a long struggle. Yeah. We talked, something you mentioned just a second ago I want to talk about, because you talked about the attacks the network was suffering on 9-11. And I know that security is an enormous part of what occupies the time for you and for everyone. Um, d can you describe the challenges of Internet security as you see them now? Wow, it's a, it's a huge problem. Uh, and as bad as people now are understanding it is, it's, it's worse. Um, it's, uh, you know, we've put, from the beginning, put huge effort into securing our infrastructure. Um, you know, because, you know, if we go down, we bring down a lot of the internet. If we're compromised, we compromise, you know, a lot of the major websites. Uh, and now recently, we've started a security business that we offer to others. Uh, you know, we've been providing that service for the government since, 
you know, 2000, but now commercially, and it's our fastest growing business. But there's big entities out there, very well funded, very smart, and very determined. And uh, they As want security threats. Yes, you know, they want to have the ability to DOS sites, they want to have the ability to steal information, they want to have the ability to corrupt information on the site and, and put their message on it, and to plant, you know, viruses for later use. It's, uh, it's very uh, troublesome and problematic. So these are not the hackers sitting in their, their dorm rooms or apartments at four o'clock in the morning. You're talking about organized enterprises that are actively working to undermine yeah. security. Big governments, organized crime, big political organizations, hacktivist organizations that are loosely you know, affiliated, uh, all much more problematic than the prototypical hacker in the bedroom. You publish, Akamai publishes a, a quarterly publication called The State of the Internet, which I think is just incredibly great. And the most recent section on security in that report said that security attacks as you're monitoring them originate now from 194 countries. About 41% of those attacks in the latest report originated from IP addresses within China. The next highest point of origin is the U.S. with 11 percent. Russia, by comparison, just so everyone will know, is number six on that list with three percent. What does that tell you about the state of where this organized, continual attack on network security is, is coming from and what the motivation for it is? Yeah, so th that would be you know, the actual machines that are doing the attacking, which the vast majority are innocent. You know, they've been, they're bots, they've been taken over by the bad guy. And, you know, we don't see the bad guy, bad guy directly because we don't penetrate those bots and go back and try to find them. We just are looking at what are the attacking IP addresses. Uh, and a lot come from the U.S. Should we be surprised by that? No, they, you know, they are, what you need is a high-powered device, a good CPU, and good connectivity. And when you have countries that have that, you're going to have a lot of bots there. Um, so it's not surprising, you know, that there's a lot from the U.S. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, China has even more, and you know, there are a lot of issues, you know, obviously with China, um, with cybersecurity. And Russia, you know, a lot of fingers are pointing at Russia these days for a lot of reasons. Um, and I guess I'd ask you the same question about Russia: Should we be compare, uh, surprised that, by comparison, Russia represents only three percent of these attacks? I mean, they're still in just sheer absolute numbers, a lot of attacks, but in percentage terms, that may be lower than some people would have thought. Well, yeah, and again, it's the 3% the of the bots are there, and there's probably less connectivity and you know, high-powered machines there than in other, other countries. Now, the attackers may well be there, but using bot armies, generally they'll use them that are global, and they'll pick the bots to be in other countries. So, the malicious entity is not necessarily where the bot is. You know, the bot could be your, your mom's computer at home, and she doesn't know. What's the challenge of tracking a bot as a and, and guarding against it as opposed to guarding against attacks from something that, that is human real time or, or any other kind of non-bot security threat? Yeah, so the bots, you know, we're actually pretty good at tracking those. The, the problem is there's a zillion of them. Um, you know, in the black market, you can, you know, buy and sell bot armies. Uh, sometimes they use them to attack each other and they steal each other's bot army. It's sort of a wacky world out there, but uh, relatively easy to, you know, get access to large infrastructure to make attacks. That gets a lot worse with the Internet of Things uh, as you have, you know, appliances and all sorts of devices that now have a pretty sophisticated CPU and communication stack on board um, that can be used in what are called reflection-based attacks. So they're not even corrupted, but they're induced to launch traffic, attack traffic at some innocent you know, mm. third party. Uh, so that's the first piece of it is you know, managing that, and we do a lot of effort around that at Akamai to, to you know, absorb those attacks or deflect them. The actual attacking entity, which is a government or organized crime, that's much more complicated because it's really hard to reach back, find out who they are, and generally they're going to be offshore and you're not going to get the cooperation you need from the government to do something about it. I'm going to talk about a couple of other things that uh, are in your State of the Internet report. You're, you look quarterly at 
connection speeds throughout the world. And in all of the top 10 lists, we see South Korea, Japan, the Netherlands, Scandinavia. The US is nowhere to be found on those lists. Latvia and the Czech Republic are higher than the US. What does that say about the status of that part of our infrastructure in this country? And what should we make of that? Well, that stat is an average over IP address that we see. Uh, and you know, a smaller country or a country that's recently installed a lot of infrastructure will have a higher average. Uh, you know, and a lot of the US doesn't yet have the high broadband into the homes. Uh, so that'll bring down the average. The final one I want to talk about is the shift to mobile and especially mobile video. We're going to show a slide now that is pretty remarkable. So this is, this is mobile traffic growth measured in petabytes per month. Orange is voice, blue is data. The far left of the graph, if you, if you can't see it, is the first quarter of 2007, only seven years ago. And you can see we've gone from near zero to up over 2,000 petabytes a month. How much of this is just sheer data? How much of it is mobile? And, and what do you see for the prospects of this curve just continuing to go up? Uh, it's going to explode continually. Uh, you know, I think today on our platform we see about half the transactions, a little less than half on a global basis, are on mobile devices. Uh, most of that's Wi-Fi connected to landline. Uh, a, f a smaller fraction of that is, you know, cellular, where we're, where we're most challenged. Uh, traffic in terms of bits, it may be maybe about a quarter in terms of bits. Um, the traffic is, you know, every time you have an app and put it on your phone, um, this, uh, some software downloads to your phone. So that's some of it. And if you watch a sporting event or a movie or something like that, a video, that soaks a ton of traffic, you know, into the device. Um, the actual applications where you're buying something, you know, less, less traffic there, but it's all going in that direction. You'll still have your TV at home that'll, you know, increasingly be over the internet, uh, and that'll have a lot of traffic, but a lot of the rest of the use will be mobile. So this is only going to get more pronounced over time. Yeah. Poor 2007, it's just going to fade away there. Yeah, you the can't even see it as it is, yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going to get to some questions from the audience here in a second, but before I do, let me ask you about, about leadership and your experience as a leader. You served as chief scientist for 14 years at Akamai, and then when a vacancy came up at the top, you wanted to become the CEO, and obviously the board embraced that, and here you are as the CEO. What, what made you decide to take on that challenge? Yeah, you know, it, it was a tough decision um, for me in some senses. You know, I'd never thought of myself as being a CEO, uh, never aspired to that per se. Uh, you know, I, and I certainly wasn't qualified to be a CEO, you know, in the early days. Uh, you know, working with George Conradis and Paul Sagan, worked really close with both of those guys over 14 years and, you know, uh, learned a ton from them. In fact, to this day, you know, uh, George is a great mentor, you know, for me, has an office, you know, across the hall and is still active with Akamai as chairman. Um, you know, so that helped a lot. But it was one of those things where, you know, I was definitely getting outside of my comfort zone, you know, to do it. And when um, Paul decided that he really wanted to step down, you know, we did a search and, and I, you know, did some soul searching, you know, to decide that, okay, you know, I want to do it and, uh, you know, I need help, you know, I want to, do the best job I can and that it was worth, you know, the risk trying to do it. I've got a couple of questions here, one of which I was, I was going to ask a version of that now that you're the CEO. Do you miss the science of it? Do you, do you get to practice much of what you really love? Yeah, that's a, you know, that's one of the tougher things. I do get to do it a little bit. Uh, I really love doing the technology yeah. side. And the trade-off for me is that, well, now, you know, being CEO, I can, you know, really more effectively enable a lot more people to do the technology. I can make sure, you know, they get the funding, you know, and one of the first things I did was go to the street and say, you know, we're taking our EBITDA margins down and we're going to use that money, you know, to invest in innovation and development and, you know, in growing the company. And, uh, you know, I, it was no question that's what I wanted to do, 
you know, some people would look at that and say, well, that, you know, is a little risky thing to do. And sure enough, the stock went down, uh, you know, in the short term as the short term holders got out. But the long term holders, you know, said, good. You know, we want to see that, you know, because we're in it for the long haul. And uh, now some of those investments, you know, it's been long enough, they're starting to pay off. Uh, and the stock's much higher now, mm -hmm. you know, as a result, I think. And what about academia? Do you ever think wistfully about those days at MIT? Yeah, you know, I love MIT, you know, and love research and teaching. And, uh, you know, if I weren't so busy with Akamai, I would miss doing that more. And, and I have, you know, with the last, you know, eight years or so, been teaching uh, every other fall, the, the core math course that computer science students take. And, uh, you know, I like doing it, and I think it's, uh, you know, great to bring academics and industry closer together. And we do hire a lot of folks out of MIT, so I, I think it's worth the company's time, you know, for me to do that. Um, and I'm gonna, and I have a person who does it with me, so that, because I do get called away or can't, you know, teach a lecture sometimes, and uh, somebody's there to backstop it. Um, but so I still have some, you know, connection with. So have a hand in. A little bit. And I spend a, you know, huge amount, more than a full time job at Akamai, of course. But sure. Uh, have, still have a connection. Now here's a question that is a really good one. Um, are you deployed in China and Russia? We talked about them as sources of security issues. Uh, and, and if not, what do they use? What's your equivalent over there? Yeah, we're deployed in both China and Russia. They're both extremely complicated environments. Um, you know, in China, technically we do it through partners who technically own our hardware. And we're a software provider to our servers there. Um, obviously, the security concerns are paramount there. Uh, and it's a tough place for somebody who distributes content to do business. So we have to have special procedures that if offensive or illegal content winds up on our servers in country, we can get rid of it quickly. Uh, Russia is more complicated. We're deployed there. We, we carried the Sochi Olympics for the Russians in Russia. Um, and uh, it's gotten a lot more complicated lately. Uh, you know, we'd, we're planning to open, you know, put feet on the ground there, and, and that's obviously been slowed down with recent developments. Yeah, yeah. You talked briefly a minute ago about the Internet of Things. Can you explore that a little bit more? This question is, how, how are you preparing for the explosion that will happen when billions more devices, not even people, come online in this Internet of Things now that's emerging? Yeah, it's uh, all part of that end going to infinity, yeah. uh, you know, and it, that's a good thing. You know, we want to enable that scalability. We want to make the communications be fast and reliable. We want to keep security, because as the more devices come online, the more bots there are, and uh, that's really problematic, you know, for the websites and applications, so providing security to defend against the attacks. Uh, you know, and we're also looking at, as you go forward, you know, how would we, you know, enable the, the massive data and the mining of the data that comes from all the sensors? You know, we deliver two trillion items a day. Every one of those has a log line with information around it. So we've built massive data mining tools for our own purposes and for our customers. And, you know, we, as you think about the Internet of Things and zillions of devices out there, well, they're out there to collect data and transmit it. And then, of course, you want to mine it and do inten intelligent things with it. And so that's an area where we've developed a lot of expertise that you know, we're, we're thinking about mm -hmm. now is how does that get used going forward? Mm. I'm going to take the last few minutes to talk with you about the future. And the last audience question that I have that I'm going to ask here actually is a really good way to begin that. What speed internet, what connection speed do you think we'll have as consumers in 10 years? Wow, you know, um, and it, when we say we, there's this country and the developed world. Sure. And, you know, we'll all have, well, 100 meg, gigabit, you know, uh, plenty of bandwidth into the home. You know, in the, for most of the people, though, in the world won't. You know, and it, and it brings up, you know, a story. I was in, in India. We have a large office there, and I'm there a lot. Um, and I was talking to one of the, you know, the, the leading, uh, the CEO of the leading publication there. And uh, I was telling him about the great new video capabilities we have that we can deliver at so many megabits a second and produce this great picture. And he goes, you know, that's very nice for about one-tenth of one percent of our population that are going to have that kind of connectivity. And he was very polite how he said it. And he goes, you know, you, know, you guys in, uh, 
in America and the Valley and you know Google and you know Amazon and all the, the players you know that you know you know about on a global basis. You know, he says you just don't get it. He said, you know, for the foreseeable future, the vast majority of the world is going to be lucky to connect at 2G. And what you need to figure out is to how to give them a good video experience at at best 50 kilobits a second. Mm. You know, and we're three or four orders of magnitude beyond that that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, but this, you know, and it could be great here, but not relevant to the billions of people over there. And and he's right. Mm. You know, so it's a uh, it's a complicated answer to that question that most of the folks will not have that kind of access, and they're going to need different capabilities to to experience the internet the way we'd like to experience it. And with only half the world's population connected, little less. Uh, what is going to happen when the other two-thirds of the world comes online? Yeah, you know, it's hard to really know. And that's part of what's so exciting uh, is that what we're doing now enables things that we can't even imagine. Just think about what well, we had the video earlier, you know, that 10 years ago, you wouldn't even have known what some of those terms meant that now are just part of everyday life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in fact, you know, our vision, our stated vision as a company, you know, is to enable the promise of the hyperconnected world, you know, and to, um, you know, we can't imagine how business and entertainment and life are going to be. There's just unimagined potential there. Hmm. Uh, but we're striving to enable it through the infrastructure. So let me ask you one final question, and maybe you'll, you'll put your academic hat back on for just a second. You've talked to a lot of students over your career. You work with them still every day. And you've given a lot of advice. If you were giving someone who's just starting out today, let's say it's someone who's crazy about algorithms and problem solving, what advice would you give them? Well, if they want to start a company or if they want to go into academics, you know, it's a sort of different, you know, approaches. Uh, you know, I, I am fully supportive of students who want to go into academics. I think that is great, uh, you know, because uh, They'll help educate others. Uh, they'll develop, you know, great technology that sometimes take a long time to be useful. Uh, and if they want to go into business, I think that's, you know, fantastic as well. And uh, the advice there would be, you know, you got to really believe that it's going to work. Uh, you got to be really persevere. You know, you can never say die. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of things that go wrong. Uh, you can't be afraid to make mistakes. You got to make decisions and go. You try to correct them as, as quickly as you can, but you can't worry ab about mistakes because you're going to make them. Uh, and uh, you got to, you know, people say it, it can't work. You got to listen and you got to think intelligently. Are they right? You know. Uh, but if you think you can make it work in spite of what you're hearing, then you keep keep after it. You know, somebody who's you know pretty intelligent person once said about Akamai was. The reason we were successful is because we were too naive to know that what we were trying to do was impossible. Uh, and that enabled us to do it because, you know, we thought, well, we can do this. And uh, didn't know enough that to all the naysayers saying, oh, you can't do that. Tom Layton, thank you for being here with us tonight. A real revolutionary. We're glad you came. Thanks. Thank you. Every day, Tom Layton's algorithms handle about two trillion requests on the internet worldwide. There are hundreds of stories like this at the Computer History Museum. Join us next time for the Computer History Museum presents Revolutionaries.